Okay. Yeah. Yes. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to call to order the February 11th Port Orchard City Council regular e meeting. Uh, please stand and join me in for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> to our first order of business, which is the approval of the agenda. Is, are there any amendments? <coughs> Councilmember yeah, Kachari. Here on the consent agenda number F, a um, couple of things we need to change that to reflect the um, absence of Councilmember Rosa Pepe for personal reasons, and also Councilmember Clausen, who's already on here, is being excused for personal reasons as well. Okay, so all three are excused for personal reasons. All right, and we have a second by Councilmember Diener for this discussion of that amendment. All in favor of um, amending the agenda to excuse the three council members, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the, um, uh, that has been amended. So any other amendments to this evening's agenda? Okay. Move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Second, Second by council member Ashby. Uh, further discussion of this evening's agenda? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the amended agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the agenda has been set. Okay, before we get to sentence and comments, I've, uh, I'd like to uh, read something into the record here. So we've received a, a number of comments uh, from citizens regarding a proposal for further development within the McCormick Woods community. I want to take this opportunity to address some of those questions raised and explain the city's process uh, in, for this land use action. First, the proposal at issue is for a subdivision and city staff is currently reviewing the application and this is a type three permit, which is review, reviewed by staff to ensure that all requirements of the Port Orchard Municipal Code are met by the applicant. The applicant application is then submitted to the, the hearing examiner for final determination. The hearing examiner will consider the, applica the application during uh, this hearing process, any public comments received prior to the hearing will be submitted to the hearing examiner and the public will also be invited to comment at the hearing. The date for that hearing has not been set, but additional public notice will be provided once that date is set. set. According to Port Orchard Municipal Code in our city, as in many other cities, this type of permit is not subject to review and approval by the city council or the mayor. If someone disagrees with the hearing examiner's decision, the recourse is in Kitsap County Superior Court. To address some of the specific questions the city has received, one is traffic. Uh, citizens have raised concerns related to parcel A, and the original development called for a four lane road. Current traffic studies in the city's current traffic improvement plan call for shoulder, pedestrian, lighting, and intersection improvements on Cliff Clifton, Old Clifton Road not a four lane road. This proposal will be reviewed for compliance what is required by the city's current standards. Uh, I've had questions about schools and citizens have raised concerns related to building a new school. And while this, the, city, the city does assess school impact fees on behalf of the school district, it, the city is not authorized under state law to require a developer to build new schools. Uh, trees has been another question, and, and many of uh, uh, many have expressed concerns related to the tree buffer along Old Clifton in the entrance to McCormick Woods. We've heard you, and the letters we've received are part of the record that will be presented to the hearing examiner. There have been comments that Parcel C was not part part of the original plat and master plan for McCormick Woods, and thus the city ha council has no obligation to approve it. It's true that Parcel A is not part of the original development agreement and its entitlements, but as a result, parcel A is a new application and must meet the city's current code requirements. Finally, the city has received comments that the proposed development is not compliance with its current CCNRs for the larger community. Any inconsistencies between the CCNRs and the proposal submitted to the city is a simple matter between the residents and the developer. Again, I encourage our citizens to submit their concerns in the form of letters to the building department will they become part of the permanent record for this hearing for this land use matter. So just wanted to put that out on the record. So we are to our first citizen comment period and it is for comments items on this evening's agenda. 
there are is a second comment period at the end of the meeting which is for any matters that anyone wants to address the council for yes ma'am Yes, you may. The Mr. Bond isn't here, unfortunately. The deadline for the here, so there, there's an application. So there's multiple steps in the process. So you can still submit a letter and have it be part of the record, but probably the more important point moment in time is when that hearing happens and before the hearing examiner, and it'll be in this room um, with the hearing examiner, and that's where you're, you can give verbal testimony. Uh, and, and additional written, but it, the, the date hasn't been set yet. We're still, the application was submitted. There was a deadline for the, related to the application. It was last Friday. Yeah, absolutely. And then we're still in the, the staff is still in the process of reviewing all of those comments and reviewing the application to ensure that it complies with code. Once that has been confirmed, then the hearing is set, and it's usually about a month from the, the time frame when they confirm that all, all the requ requirements have been met. And we are supposed to review that? We'll... So Mr. anybody Marshall. within 300 feet of the actual property receive a direct mailing as a part of the SEPA process, anybody that can be of record, so anybody else can either send a letter or come to the hearing. And the timeline is established through state statute of so many days to issue the SEPA determination. There's a comment period. So that's how outlined in our CW. Yeah. State, under, under state law. Yeah. Yeah. Once, once the date for the hearing is determined, you'll get a notice of public hearing. Okay. Yeah, and Janine, I believe, has a, a you put those on Facebook, don't you? Do you not? Do you put what, what? There's a list that you can sign up. That you push that information out. Huh? Yeah, we do have a uh, distribution list that you can sign up for. It's basically all public notices from the city. So if um, DCD wants to go ahead and push out that public notice, they can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So if DCD wants to go ahead and push out that notice of the hearing, we can get it on Facebook. We can do it through that distribution list. And if you guys want to ask me, I can definitely let you know where to go for yeah. that. Or you can sign up for that. Yeah, definitely. So if you go to our website, which is cityofportorchard.us. I'm sorry? We got the letter, so would we get another letter if they The letter, that would be for probably the DCD department, and so I, I don't know. I would just what what Mr. Saying. Dorsey was referring to, if you've got a letter before, you were within the 300 feet, you should get another letter. There's there's folks, though, that are outside of that ring of that 300. Where, it's, where the action is happening, of parcel A. Yeah. I'm, I'm the developer prepares a list that's reviewed by DCD to ensure and they have a map and they have a list of every property owner that falls within that area that they get direct mailings. But that doesn't mean that you can't be party to the application. You simply have writing letters to DCD. Uh, we usually put something like that on our web page. So there's going to be plenty of opportunity uh, to know when the hearing through the HOA, I'm sure that they're gonna post it. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for everybody to be uh, at noticed as to when uh, the hearing will, will be. And even after the hearing, you can still, there's a comment period even after the hearing where you can still provide additional information up to a certain so, set off. I think Mr. And Carson then there's the right. ability to appeal. And there's an appeal thing, uh, timeline, so. Yeah. So there's, we're not gonna do this in a vacuum, I can assure you. Uh, we are going to put it on our website. We're going to push it on Facebook. Uh, if you so, if you sign up as you know to our Facebook notifications, Can you'll. Say it's going to Facebook. Uh, yeah, it's on our it's on our web. Ginny, it's right. the. Yeah, I believe it's City of Port Orchard government. Okay. Yeah. The and other if you thing. Have any questions? You can definitely just uh, give us a call at the main desk, and also through the distribution list. If you just go to our website, scroll down to the bottom, and there's a spot to sign up for mailings or sign up for public. You're welcome. Yep. Want to give her that phone number just in case she had a problem? Oh, absolutely. It's at 360-876-4407. Uh, 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 You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. 
Charles Burr Ashby. No, I was just going to recommend that um, if you go to the distribution list, you can find out everything that's going on. They do a really nice job of sending you um, even our council agendas and other items of interest for the city, and you would find out about all of the public notices or public hearings through that distribution list. I highly recommend it. And you're not going to see that that action in this council in the council meeting agendas. It's going to be a hearing examiner's um, uh, what is it? What is what's public? Yeah, it's a. I got a kind of silly question. Okay. So the city has to per, approve the, the permit. We they are. Vetted, but yet you don't have any input. We have okay. We have state law and we have city code and we 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 have to come and the city code just doesn't apply to McCormick Woods. It's citywide, and so every developer is held to the sa exact same standards, you know, in every subdivision that's that's brought before the city. So it's compl making sure that it complies with state law and our city code is what staff the process staff is going through right now. Right. Once they've made that determination, and it's possible the developer could make amendments to this these these drawings between now and that hearing examiner. No, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. Uh, and then there's going then there's going to be this hearing examiner public hearing where you're going to have an, an opportunity to prevent pre present additional co written comment and additional verbal comment and yeah, that's and where you would test it. And if I may, there will be a staff report available to the public on the proposal, and it's not a decision of the city per se; it's the hearing examiner. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that there are two two main breaks. So everything that's happening now with the applications and the uh, the SEPA determinations and leading up to the hearing and the hearing record and anything that comes out of that conditions of approval mitigation measures that's all the entitlement side you have to get completely through the entitlement side uh, basically resolve conditions and mitigation measures and have those all put into place and so that's the part where we're complying with the city and state co code where you have to comply with the Department of Ecology stormwater manual you have to comply with you know the zoning and all these oh shoot, all these conditions once that's in place then those conditions are the framework for the actual permits that you mentioned so the city will issue permits once we've reviewed that everything that the developer submitted to construct complies with all the mitigations and conditions that came out of the entitlement process so there's you know we're nowhere near permits being issued we have to go through the whole entitlement phase then you get into the developer submits the construction plans those get reviewed and approved based on compliance with the conditions well, I think we're all a little confused because your original permit is going to start building in January and so that building moratorium went into effect and then that went into effect and then I heard that they want to say it's going to be two more years and now I, I don't know what it's well be. I think m there's a lot of misinformation yeah. in anything and you need to believe less than you believe more of misinformation so it's there's I can't say whether it's six months a year or two years or five years you know, right. th there's a there's an application for that land development and they it's it's the beginning of a process right the entitlement is for five years so once they go through this whole entitlement phase and get an approved preliminary plot they have up to five years to actually construct that development the process. to start the construction process Permits. No, Correct. they yeah. can't. They Correct. No, there's, there's. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yes. I, I tried to address some of the misconceptions that I've seen in, in the, many of the letters and the comments I've got. I'll make sure that we put Good. what I read into the record here out on Facebook and on our web page. You know, all we can really do is deal in facts. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, you know, they've submitted up an application. We're processing that application, and there's going to be other other points for you know, for you to, you know, comment in this process. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yeah. Yeah. questions yeah. later. These comments yeah, we, are, are. We've really got to move up. Okay. This is not probably appropriate for our business meeting, but we have reused. I've probably received 
a hundred or more letters. Yes, and yes, I've, I've read them. Yeah, we've got a, the, we've the got comment a, period is at the end of the meeting, so that, that at that point you can absolutely share that information. Yeah, and, and, exactly. and just, just remember, though, the it's a public comment period. It's not, we're not supposed to be doing what we're doing right now. This is the business meeting, and it is a public comment period. We're not, we're not going to engage in a back and forth. You're, you can make a statement, but, you know, so we're going to, so we're going to move on with our meeting. So, all right, so we are to our, so we, we, we're to our first citizen comment period, which for, is for anything on this evening's agenda. So anybody wishing to testify on or provide comment on anything on this evening's agenda? Hearing none, I'm gonna close that first citizen comment period. We are to our consent agenda as am, is amended. Yes, and I would move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion by council member Ashby, a second by council member Chang. Any further discussion of this evening's consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the consent agenda is approved. We have a presentation this evening. Kathleen Wilson, the manager of our downtown Port Orchard Library is here to give us uh, a talk about our book of the year and probably all kinds of neat things that are going on down at the library. So Kathleen. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I am Kathleen Wilson and I am the manager right down the street, right by the foot ferry dock of our downtown library. And I'm here to talk to you about our One Book, One Community 2020 initiative. Um, we've been encouraging our community to read the same book for over a decade now, every winter. Um, and this year, as all of you know, we are facing a housing crisis. Um, in our community, in our downtown, um, and to a much larger degree in Seattle and more urban areas. And I want to invite all of you to take part in learning more about what it's like to be truly housing insecure, facing eviction and losing all that your home can mean, and the impact that this crisis is having on an individual level. Um, you each have a copy of Evicted by Matthew Desmond. This is our book that we've chosen um, to ignite community conversation this year. Uh, this book follows eight families in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as they struggle with housing insecurity. We get to know these families on a personal level. They become real to us because they are real. This is a nonfiction title. Uh, we read about their struggle to keep a roof over their heads and their families together. You'll read about Arlene, who is struggling to keep her family, including her young sons, Jory and Jafaris, housed. Uh, as they have to live in shelters, she's struggling to find an outlet to plug in Jaf Jafaris's nebulizer. Um, for his treatment for his asthma, being turned down again and again as she searches for housing, not only because she has an eviction on her credit report, but just simply because she has children um, that live with her. You'll read about Lamar, a disabled veteran who struggles doing odd jobs for his landlord, trying to fend off eviction for himself and his teenage sons, and the group of other neighborhood boys that his, his son's friends that live with them. You'll meet Sharina, who is now a landlord, owning multiple properties around Milwaukee, having grown up in the same environments that she now finds herself actively maintaining for her tenants. Choosing to look the other way when repairs need to be made, finding herself frequently now on the other side of the eviction crisis. Sociologist Matthew Desmond completely immersed himself in the landscape of these families, living on the precipice of eviction and suffering the consequences of what it means. This is not an easy book but it's one that we at Kitsap Regional Library feel is well worth reading and discussing in our community. Um, we've had some discussions on this with our community at the library, um, and I was just at one down at the Manchester Library yesterday, and um, it, really, it really does stimulate good conversation. Um, I have a copy for each of you. Um, and these books were provided through a grant that the library received and through our library foundation in order to help stimulate the conversation. So please read it and pass it along. And I also included a copy for each of the council members and the mayor of our Inspire magazine, which is our quarterly magazine at the library that lists all of our events that are happening. But there's a special um, insert in here for the One Book programs. And coming up, we have our main event for the One Book 
coming up on February 22nd. Uh, this year it's being held at the Central Kitsap uh, Middle School. Um, that's on Saturday the 22nd. So this will be a community conversation, including some of our community partners, um, including Kirsten Jewell of the Kitsap County Department of Human Services. Um, and it's just a, a way to uh, hear from community partners and how they're dealing with the housing crisis and then to, to have a more community conversation. And then on Sunday the 23rd here at our library, we're hosting um, professors from the University of Washington and the research team that undertook the eviction study that has helped to inform the eviction law in Washington State. So they will be there at our library um, teaching uh, and telling us about how uh, they conducted that study and the results from that study. And that's part of our university program. We have those once a quarter at the Port Orchard Library. It's where we have local professors from um, universities and colleges around the area come and teach a mini course. So that's our university program for this quarter. So I want to thank you for having me here today. Um, the book, again, is Evicted. And uh, for those of you that didn't get a copy, we have plenty of copies to check out at the library as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Questions for Kathleen about the book or things going on at our local library? Did we get the roof fixed? Uh, we're working on it. <laughs> we're working on the roof. <coughs> Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> let's, uh, let's not have any rain on that day because we're going to take the roof off. Yeah. All right. So moving on to our business items. The first is uh, <clears throat> item A, adoption of a resolution accepting council committee assignments and establishing a council standing committees. <coughs> and you have a revised version of this uh, at the dais here because uh, it got cleaned up since the retreat. Uh, Brandy ori originally <coughs> did it at the retreat and then since then uh, a few pieces moved. So. I would make, oh, you make Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt a resolution <coughs> accepting council committee assignments and establishing council standing committees. Second. A second by council member Kachardi. Discussion? Go ahead. Council yes, I would like um, to amend the resolution or make an edit to it. Okay. On the back side. <coughs> The PSRC Transpol is, I am on the Transpol, but that is a KRCC appointment, not a City of Port Orchard appointment. So that should be eliminated. Okay. And that's Transpol, that's? PSRC Transpol. Okay. Yeah. I'll second that. I still don't see it. There it is. There, I know I found it. Okay. Can you catch that, Janine? So we have an amendment to remove the PSRC transpol uh, from that because Councilman Brashby is correct. That is appointed by, um, you know, and that r runs true for the um, uh, the growth management yeah. policy board. Also, those should both be captured in that same amendment, if you don't mind. Please. And where I am, the now the alternate. So you. Do you want to restate your motion? I'm not seeing you. I'm seeing on the front page there, where Scott, so Mr. Diener was Scott's struck name. and I was added. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm looking. Down. I'm not looking at the revised. The very last line on the first page. Right. 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 So okay. the P PSRC growth management policy. Growth my, what my motion? What my motion would be? Um, would be to eliminate any reference to PSRC appointments that are made through KRCC, which would be the Growth Management Board and the Transpol Board, <coughs> not the Executive Board, because that was a city appointment. Right. It does get confusing. I will second that motion. Okay. Is everybody clear? Yeah. What we're removing? All right. With that, we're voting on the amendment to remove the two PSRC boards uh, that are appointed by KRCC. Lots of acronyms here. Puget Sound Regional Council and Kitsap Regional Coordinating Council. That's what those acronyms stand for. And uh, all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Then the amendment is approved. So we're back to the main motion. Further discussion of the main motion? 
right, all in favor of the main motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hear none. The, committee, the uh, committees and standing committees are approved. We are to our second business item, uh, approval of change order number 30 to contract number 037-17 with active construction for the Tremont Widening Project. Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. On November 26, 2019, the Port Orchard City Council authorized change orders number 28 and 29 for contract C037-17 with active construction, thereby bringing the current value of all change orders to date to a total of 2.238 and some numbers, um, or 223.9% 20, of the contingency value. Tonight's action is for the approval of change order 30, which is the final quantities for all work schedules at $53,769.63. So approval of this change order brings the current value of all change orders to date to a total of $2,292,353.60, or 229.2% of our contingency value, being below the 230% cap or the 2.3 million that we had contingency plus the additional funding. So we have about uh, $7,646 left. Um, this final change order for the Tremont Street widening project pursuant to the final reconciliation between the city's CACM team and the contractor. Um, that was actually a statement, not a question. Upon approval of change order number 30 this evening, the final approved project cost will be 15 million uh, $71,532.77. So staff recommends that the city council authorize the mayor to execute change order number 30 with active construction in an amount not to exceed $53,769.63. And we already have uh, pay estimate 26, I think is in tonight's package. And then there'll be, I believe pay estimate 27 will be the final for the project. And then we're under this, we have about nine months left of the plant establishment period. So plant, PSIP, plant survival and initiation period, something like that. So the contractor keeps their $13 million bond in place for about $40,000 worth of work until we get to the end. And once they've maintained all the plants and any plants that have died over the year, they replace them. And then we completely close out the project. So we're not 100% done but we're very close. Had a couple of accidents already, and hmm. we've lost a, tr a, a street light that's, uh, I think, on order, and Friday's windstorm brought a tree down on our brand new fence, too, down there, and so we've got that on the list of things to fix, too, so. Uh, coming yeah, we're, eastbound. So if you're coming from uh, McCormick, you know, as you, the road separates there, it's, it's tough to see when it's wet. Okay. And then dark, so we're going to put, uh, you know, ref reflectors. Ray Mark calls them raised, raised pavement markers. They have a RPMs, so reflectors. Is there a motion? I move to authorize the mayor to exec uh, execute change order number 30 with active construction ink in an amount not to exceed $53,769.63. Second. Second by Council Member Tiener. Any questions for Mr. Dorsey on this matter? Great to be closing this out. So all in favor of approving the uh, change order number 30 for to active construction for the Tree Not, Tremont Widening Project, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved. We're to our last business item, business item C, approval of the January 21st City Council Work Study Meeting Minutes. And do I have any? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I move approval of the Council January 21st meeting minutes. Since only two of us can vote on it. Right. So if Councilmember <coughs> Diener abstains because he was absent. I abstain. And I, um, we may need to bring this one back. Yeah. Can't take action on this. Okay. Can't take action on this. Okay. Didn't think that far ahead. Sorry. We'll bring that back. Gene, can you bring that back next, uh, next meeting? Okay. All right. Um, we have a bit of an unruly work study meeting next week, so I brought 
three uh, what I hope are pretty uh, brief discussion items forward from next week's work study. Uh, the first is the, uh, the RFQ. Uh, we tried to talk about that at the night of our uh, wor last work study ahead of the park uh, plan update and uh, it just, we ran out of time. So uh, you asked that I bring it back and I, so I have. There's a couple of points that are highlighted in that and one was, the second one was at Council Member Ashby's request that we have an independent review uh, outside of the consultant uh, in this process. And then yesterday I talked to the Public Facilities District and yes, last night I got a, uh, a letter from them that I put on the dais here tonight. I'm sorry I didn't get it in the packet. And related to, the, the, they're, they're encouraging us to move forward um, in issuing our RFQ and uh, commencing our process. The, P, the commerce review of PFD is not related necessarily to our project in particular at this point in time. It's related to the public facilities district to pay their bills. And uh, that's where this, the Wenatchee project, in particular when they issue bond indebtedness, and, and so that isn't the case at, at this point in time at all. Um, everything that we're issuing in this RFQ is roughly $2.5 million, and I believe they have close to that in, the, in their bank account. And the next year and a half to hopefully not two years, um, is in steps one and two are roughly $400,000, which the, the public facilities district sh uh, should not have any trouble. Uh, it, when we get to purchasing real estate, um, and particularly the last step when we're to 100% design documents, uh, if, and hopefully we get to that point, um, that's, that's when there will be an extensive review. Uh, it's a different animal than the the first few steps in this process. So I'm, Council I'm, Member Ashby? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember my thought process before, but um, but what my, what my concern was is that we were issuing an RFQ for a consultant that is going to take the project from beginning to end. Um, beginning to 100% design. Oh, beginning to 100% design. Okay. Not, not to the end. Not to the end, okay. It could, it could be that same, we could ish, we're, could we would hire potentially what another my consultant. Co what my concern was is that we were hiring a consultant to do all of this. And at some point before we moved on to what would be what we're calling task two, I wanted a feasibility study done by the city and I wanted it done by someone other than this consultant because this consultant has a vested interest in the outcome of that. And it's a, that was my concern. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure, so I had was actually had the position that perhaps this consultant should just do one, phase one, but having an independent feasibility study is fine with me. I just, I just wanna make sure every step of the way that we've had an independent opinion um, of what we're doing. And it just seemed to me if we hired one person to do all of this, he could be biased. Slanted process? Yeah, slanted at some point. And remember, this is, tonight I'm just bringing you the RFQ. Correct. We are not, there's gonna be additional language that our, right. our city attorney is gonna help us with when it comes to this actual contract and we negotiate the scope of work. And, and this was just, kind of a check-in with you before, and I didn't want to bring right. back a contract <coughs> you weren't comfortable with. Right. I wanted to get out of the gate right. Yeah, one question I'd have too, and I understand what we're trying to do with, you know, trying to put out an RFQ for multiple of these tasks, right? Yes. Um, but some of them should be contingent upon the completion of the ones before, right? I mean, let's just say, for example, task one says feasibility study. In the event this thing comes back and it's not feasible, why would we have already started work on task two, three, four, or et cetera? Number two, you know, while we're contemplating a particular site, there's a lot of research that needs to be done to see if that site is even the right site or if it's feasible. And mm -hmm. so in task two, there's a lot of site-specific issues. So I'm just wondering that somehow I think in this contract it needs to be worded that I think it's informed by, you know, there could be 
and I, and stopping I, points that the yeah. thing doesn't go further because of yeah. what we might find in one of the preliminary stages. Yeah, and, and I think our, the, this RFQ actually, we learned a lot about this process from the ILA mm -hmm. to, the, to the, the R, where we went to this RFQ. And so I, I, that's, and that's part of why we've merged this stuff together because we, we, this doesn't start with a feasibility study at all. I don't believe that teasability study is coming a little bit later. We're starting with public outreach, site identification, because we have a developer that identified the first site. Okay, we didn't engage with our citizens or this or, or this body um, in in the identification of that site. Could be the best site. We don't know that, and so that's one of the things. For the second thing, I think this this uh, or part of that these, this first step. Um, seeking city council, public, and stakeholder input on those possible sites, and then uh, <coughs> in this, and this, this is in the, uh, the RFQ. I'm reading from the RFQ. Assess the as alternatives for the uh, for ownership. Um, I had a very productive meeting with Kathleen on Thursday with Jill Jean, and uh, and White Library reaffirming their uh, commitment to this process and, and wanting uh, to be a partner in this. Um, that's the only strong partner I feel I have right now. Uh, the other public partners uh, put things on paper, but I'm, I'm not feeling warm and fuzzy at all. And what, and Jean and I, Jill, Jean and I had a very frank conversation too about uh, us getting out of the library. And you know, we go through this process and build this new community center and, and the library gets, to, gets a new library, we're gonna get out of the library facilities business. Now, that being said, we have to recognize we have hopefully a building that's, you know, if it's if, if it's the Kingston model, it's three partners at about a third a piece and that maintenance, ongoing maintenance and operations needs to be spread three ways or whatever those percentages end up being when we identify what the size, scope and who the partners are in that building. But if, if we have the operation and maintenance costs and responsibilities all the way under task two. Um, do we have any of that up in task one? I don't know that. Um, that's a good question. It, it, it is, um, I think first we've got to figure out the site and the partners. That's why it, 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 I'm agreeing with Sean a little bit in that some of these things I don't know that they're in order or out of order, but even before we do it, in order for us to do an independent feasibility study, we're gonna need to know yeah. what those operating yeah. costs the, are in our partnerships. So you're right. This What's in the attachment B, that's why we've somewhat, we've, we squished these steps together. And, and we're gonna rely on, when we enter into this contract with the consultants that I'm gonna, we're gonna bring back, I'm gonna, uh, we, we're not experts. I, no, I need. I, right. I need this. You know, we need this consultant to tell us how this. You know how we need to do this. Uh, you know, and, and so there's a lot more work to do on this, um, obviously. And mm -hmm. we're going to interview consultants, uh, find an expert in this field, and then engage in a contract with them, and then work through a process that you will be very involved in. That makes sense. And, and part of that, I mean, our staff is pedaling as hard as they can. Oh, I know. And that's know. why we want a consultant that's going to, you know, has the expertise and the bandwidth to put their arms around this and give it the attention that it deserves because these are big decisions and we want to do it right. With that, further questions on this? And Nick is out. Uh, I think he comes back tomorrow and I'm not going to. You know, you've got a few days to read this stuff, and if you've got concerns or, uh, you know, things you think I'm missing here, you know, get back to me in the next few days. I don't think we're going to get this out on the street until sometime next week. Uh, you know, and then we've got a, probably at least a three or four week period before we start interviewing consultants. And if anybody wishes to be on that consultant interview panel, uh, feel, feel free to reach out to me too. Love to include you.
Okay, with that, I'm going to move on to item B, which is a, remember we had the mm. proposal for the wraps, and we weren't real excited about it. Uh, well, we've had an artist reach out to <coughs> us, and uh, I think Janine's got copies of it, and Mr. Dorsey, you want to just talk about this? Yeah, so the city received a proposal from Desmond Hansen, and he's specifically looking at the uh, signal traffic signal control boxes at uh, Sydney and Bay Street, which is state DOT. So the most important thing is on page 72 of the packet. I mean, he's got some graphics of work that he's done, um, but the real meat of the conversation really is the condition that Watch Dogs will be upon. Um, I don't see anything in these conditions that um, are problematic, uh, this is a lot. This is a lot better proposal than the vinyl wrap, which you know one of the conditions was that it doesn't block or cover any venting of the cabinet, or that vinyl you'd have to go and put it on and then cut it just to get it. So this is a much better proposal. So well, it's expensive also. Yeah. So we just have to make sure that if, if the council decides to move ahead with this that you know that the artist knows that they've got to meet these conditions and these are just ideas for pictures i mean i think we could uh, have the artist bring us i mean they've got a one's got to be uh rectangular uh in width and the other one uh taller and uh i'm not p opposed to the pictures that i've seen there of, of our downtown at the turn of the century and uh, if you want other ideas brought back we can do that too but uh, I thought this was a pretty good proposal is he proposing to so he suggested uh, a couple historical photos is he proposing to paint those on yes yeah. Yeah. Wow of, of his work yeah I, I, I like I personally like the idea we've talked about it I think we struggled with how to get it moving um, I think having a couple boxes out there would be good and maybe would generate further interest. Okay. And you're not approving a contract tonight, obviously, right, right. but I just wanted some feedback, what you thought. And um, th like I said, this was a less expensive alternative. It, I think it's gonna be more, more, you know, as long as it doesn't get vandalized, more durable. Um, we had some concerns about the vinyl wrap uh, mm -hmm. idea, and, as did Washdot, and it's their, their cabinet. So, how about, yeah, about $2,000 for the two, two cabinets. So why don't we, I'll have Public Works work with the artist and bring back, are you comfortable with these images or would you like some others to consider? Um, well, I like the era that these pictures are from. I'm not crazy about these two specific pictures. Okay, so we'll have um, the artist give us, you know, a handful of options and if we have to, you know, <laughs> I well, well. Uh, you wanted it a work study. I'd rather just uh, versus a committee, and then the right. full council doesn't like what the committee picked. Um, you know, and if we have to do like we do committees that you know, and put it on a board, and everybody gets one vote, you know, we'll try to make it as painless as possible. I'd suggest you look at some of the historical photos that we have yeah. on the walls. Yeah, here. Okay. As a start, maybe some okay. some that are more representative of the overall sort of downtown view yeah. that we've got. Yeah, perhaps. Okay, maybe we'll try to get four or five for each, uh, each style, what tall and then wide, and bring it back to a work study. And I don't think this is anything that's going to happen until spring or summer, right. um, <coughs> as far as painting it. So, all right, our last discussion item is the uh, parking rates downtown. We've been uh, you approved uh, some some changes to parking in the consent agenda tonight and we've been bantering around um, the and I drove the park downtown parking a lot again this morning every spot spot in the paid parking is is full I mean and uh, the merchant lot did not have a single car in it so you approved this evening the the ability for folks to park uh, in those uh, for four hour parking as well <coughs> as merchants so that that lot's getting utilized at least. The, the bigger discussion um, 
is our rates and um, I know we used to have a monthly rate and I got a, an email from a citizen today advocating for a monthly rate uh, and um, but he was citing King County Metro's rates and 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 they're a transit agency uh, we're you know we're not and 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 uh, <coughs> our transit agency matter of fact where they operate park and ride lots you park for free and and I think that's that's what we're trying at least I am trying to encourage is that we not utilize our waterfront for parking cars on it, at least long-term parking mm. on our on our waterfront and that those park and ride lots are uh, better utilized and we're working can, no, can transit has a study to identify a um, a site or sites on the west side of the city um, maybe around Sedgwick and uh, Sydney or our dump site uh, there and by the industrial park just off the freeway are, are good sites those are going to take years um, to develop but Armory's park and ride lot is a, typically at capacity so is Annapolis uh, which is um, used for what is the um, ride share? The uh, but, but Annapolis, I don't believe, is being used now. Because it isn't currently being used because it's under construction. But it's we're within a few Actually, weeks or is. a month. They're shoveling people back and forth. But it is the dock isn't being <coughs> used. Yeah, correct. There is capacity at. I drive. Was there no one there? I, there was no one there today when I was there. Okay. I can say I drive that road once or twice a day and since they've started construction I'm not sure that there are cars parking in there okay. I, I don't know I assumed it was empty because of the construction requirements and I concur with that when I drove there today it was the lot was empty but it normally isn't because there's normally once the dock's done it'll be back to but that lot is typically full and it's um, two or more people were carpools I think those were the words I was looking okay. for and registered carpools um, the Mitchell uh, park and ride lot has has capacity in it, and the and the Southworth uh, at Harper Church has a ton of capacity to it, and will I think relieve some pressure off of uh, our downtown when that ferry operation starts um, this summer or actually this fall. But uh, you know, I think our rates are a little. I, I'm comfortable with the you know the hour the hourly rate of a dollar you know but when we get to a full day uh, I'm not sure that's the right number and I'm not sure the challenge to that, that weekly if somebody buys a weekly pass you're not guaranteed a spot um, and and do we want to even sell that pass so those are mm. those are my <coughs> thoughts Bremerton's ten dollars a day for their parking on their waterfront um, is a well, I think we're inviting criticism if we sell passes by the week, but then there's not guaranteed spots. So I think it's problematic. Yeah. I also have a question about these van pools, because um, the it, staff our, report we got mm -hmm. said that the commuter van pools or carpool parking passes are non refund guaranteed designating parking spaces between the hours of 4 a.m. and 10 a.m. I don't know where the van pool park it's cars are and. If you, if, if we're talking about our waterfront area, if you, if you're not parked there by seven, seven thirty, there's not a spot. So, I don't know how we're guaranteeing those van but pools. Either. I can, I'm talking to the finance department on, on that particular pass. No one takes buys our thirty-five dollar pass because Kitsap Transit provides that for free, hmm. and that's what Annapolis is. Everybody that's that whole lot fills up. If you register your carpool with Kitsap Transit, you can park, park it in for Annapolis. free right. at Annapolis. A in Annapolis. Right. So but my question is, do we have commuter van pool or carpool parking we, we, downtown? We have a pass, and they would park in the paid parking with their pass. Correct. But it says that, that we have face spaces for them from 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. So my question is... Guaranteed designated parking spaces, yeah. Right. That doesn't seem to be accurate. I, I would question the accuracy Th of that. that. I mean, that's, we, my, that's my question. Yeah. I the, the lot is full, and, it, and if people got there at 9, I don't think <clears throat> we could guarantee that. No, so that this verbiage is problematic, but it isn't an issue currently because nobody's taking us up on 
this it's parking pass okay. because you can get the same service for free. Okay. So why would you pay us $35? Right, okay. okay. I'd also like to throw out that there is parking at the Methodist Church Office Sydney, which is monthly for $50. Mm -hmm. Now that's more of a walk than the downtown parking, which is mm -hmm. closer, which should be possibly higher. I'm gonna go ahead and state my position on this. And until the Annapolis lot is available again, and we have um, the construction there is causing inconvenience for those particular commuters, I'm not inclined to increase our parking rates. Um, just because we've already inconvenienced these people through no fault of our own, but I don't see raising the rate at this time until there's a little until that has settled a bit okay. and i'll same comment on that you know i know we've debated this in the past or similar subjects and i think where i'm inclined to fix something is a couple of things we just heard here today the van pool issue is a possible problem it's not a problem but it could be the way things are written <coughs> um comment that uh councilman diener brought up with this weekly pass people are buying a weekly pass they might not have a spot so i think that could get cleaned up but I, I don't know what we're trying to accomplish by affecting rates in, in this scenario. Because at the end of the day, I believe if we take up our, our daily price by a dollar or two dollars or three dollars, it's still going to be full. And so is this because the city needs more revenue to, to support the parking lot? Then I would like to hear that. I'm not hearing that. I think we're just doing it for the sake of doing it to be competitive in the marketplace. And I don't know if there's a justification to charge our users more rates. Now, if there's a parking shortage, I still wouldn't do it with a with a rate hike. I would literally, you know, slowly but surely probably recommend that we take five or six or eight stalls from there and put it take it out of daily parking and into hourly parking to to address that parking shortage. I don't think we have a parking shortage right now, but in time, if we did, you know, again, I don't think we should solve a parking shortage by charging a dollar or two more dollars, because I don't think it's gonna fix anything. I think people are still gonna park there. Our waterfront's gonna be full. We went through this three or four years ago, our lot's still full. So unless we have a, a business need at the city to affect rates, I don't know what problem we're solving by charging a dollar or two more. So to address, so you're right on the when I typically drive downtown, I find the four hour parking anywhere from 50% to two thirds full. Um, streets usually, you know, depending on the time of the day is, is busier. The part, part of the issue and, and what I've heard from the development community is we're, our parking is too inexpensive and if we are wanting develop, the development community, to, I think we should get out of the parking business. And I think that should be uh, at least the some of that park our parking lot should be park and open space. And <coughs> if we want the development community um, to as they build a parking structure or or um, a redevelopment happens in our downtown, if we're charging an artificially low rate, it won't pencil for them to create additional parking. So. Th the, the rates need to be higher if to support the development of parking. I'd have to get more detail on that. Who are they trying to park, right? If you're building a resident and someone wants well, they have to park. They have parking. to park that. But if we want parking beyond that in a, in a structure, it's got it. It doesn't. It doesn't pencil at eight dollars a stall for a fifty thousand dollars stall. And it might stall. not. And at that point, then I think we could look at that data, but. Just, I don't see that problem today. So I don't know what okay. we're trying to do to, again, just raise rates today for something that might happen five or 10 years from now I when we don't have a problem. I think we might need a little more study because I, I of course, don't have to drive to, to get to work because I can walk down the hill. But I hear from a lot of commuters who do park and they are very aware of the, the price of parking in Bremerton. Uh, Bremerton has parking rides. They're aware of how much it is at Annapolis and Port Orchard. And so in their mind, they are comparing rates. And I think we have to figure out, do we see our waterfront as an all-day parking spot? We hear occasionally from people who want to park in Seattle and they expect to park on the waterfront at any time and, and be able to go over. And that's not, I think most of us haven't quite envisioned that way. Um, but I think, you know, and I think our website's done a good job of listing the different kinds of parking. We need to continue to communicate that. Like, these are other places to park. 
The other side to that, though, is, is, is so, so say the argument you could drive to Bremerton and park for $10. The people that are driving to our waterfront are paying $8 and then $2 each way. They're paying $12. And so they don't have to deal with the gorse headache. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I would never do it. But right. they, it, it is interesting that they would consider going to Bremerton because it's, you know, then they have the car. They don't have to wait for the half-hour boat. And right. There are all sorts of choices. So what I've heard this evening is that we should strike the word guaranteed out of that, out of, <coughs> out of the uh, commuter. And I, I think any, I don't think we should be guaranteeing it either in any of those stalls. If, the, if it's <coughs> available, it's available. I see the word guaranteed in downtown merchant passes and I see it in the, uh, in the van pool verbiage too. Yeah. So I think that should be struck. And I've heard concerns from Councilmember Diener that we're selling a weekly pass that we may not have a stall for right. and whether we have a weekly pass and we strike that so is that about the extent of what i've <coughs> i've heard okay so i think we've ca janine you captured that all right we'll bring that back at a future meeting we are done with our discussion items uh council committee reports there's only one that's met and that was economic development and tourism and Council Member <coughs> Charty, you're the new chair of that committee. Yes, so we met yesterday here, uh, 9.30 a.m. Those in attendance were uh, the new committee uh, met for the first time, so I'll back that up. And the new committee is uh, Council Member <coughs> Doug Ashby, Council Member Fred Chang, and myself. Um, kind of midway through the meeting, they asked me to serve as chairman um, moving forward. Um, also in attendance was staff uh, Reinerson and staff Carrie Salee, and our guest in the in the uh, at the table that day was Jack Edwards, Matt Murphy, and, and Kathleen Wilson, who I think just left. Um, so I think uh, the focus of yesterday's meeting was really just to kind of get a little bit of a of a historical view of what the committee has been working on the last six years. So we got two new committee members, and so we just talked about some of the things that have been worked on in the past from the wayfinding systems that are that are all out there and, and has beautified our city, um, the online special event toolkits, you know, Roger Brooks seminars back in the day, the tourism strategic plan. Um, we've also talked about um, reaching out to the newly elected Port Commissioner Gary Anderson from our community to see if he would like to sit on and be an active part of the economic, our economic committee. Um, we also talked about how both myself and Councilmember Luke Urelli will be a part of the KEDA board, and so there should be probably a little bit more information shared between our committee and the Kitsap Economic Development Alliance as a result of us having a participation on a quarterly basis. We did talk about parking a little bit during our meeting, so this was, tonight was a little bit of a carryover from that conversation. And we did also talk about the Downtown Community Event Center and um, how it's also interfacing with kind of the overall downtown county campus sub area plan and EIS that is already underway and just kind of how those things tie together. Um, Carrie's going to continue to provide the committee with monthly updates on commercial building permits, land use permits, and pre-application meetings. We'll be able to share that with the council. We just always want to make sure that there's new activity going into the city that uh, we as council members are aware of it. So something we appreciate that will continue to, to feed that. And then Brandy's also going to take a look at the website just to see if there's anything that might be missing um, that we might be able to, to place onto the website on this subject matter for people that might be interested in relocating to Port Orchard. Um, we also um, talked about some potential changes that the uh, um, our state electeds are looking at for the use of LTAC funds. There really isn't anything right now, but it's something that could could come about. So just to continue to, to take a look at our legislators and how it can impact how we can utilize our lodging funds. And then we also talked about um, the foot ferry service, as you know, we've expanded foot ferry service. Port Orchard pays a, a portion in, in those expanded hours on weekends during the summer months. Um, there's been some requests from the city to of city of Bremerton to open that back up and perhaps fund some additional times. The committee yesterday didn't see that in the data and felt like the decision that um, we talked about last fall um, and the, the data just shows that it doesn't make sense to continue to subsidize additional um, ferry service when there's no one riding the ferry so that was basically it we adjourned at 10 34 and our next meeting will be monday march 20 i'm sorry march 9th 2020 right here in council chambers
don't believe any other committees have met, but I'll quickly run through when these committees, the, the new committees are okay. scheduled to meet. So finance is next Tuesday uh, here at City Hall, 5 o'clock on the 18th, February 18th. I see utilities February 19th at 9.30 a.m. Um, sewer Advisory Committee February 19th at 6.30 p.m. Those are both here at City Hall. And uh, land use is scheduled for March 2nd, 9.30 a.m. at, at uh, the Department of Community Development. And our new Transportation Committee is scheduled to meet February 25th here at City Hall, 5 p.m. Um, lodging tax doesn't have a meeting scheduled and chimes and lights is going to meet on February 24th outside agencies um, got a couple here um, the KRCC at Kitsap Regional Coordinating Council I shouldn't use that acronym um, there was the call for projects and uh, for the funding funding for 2022 and 2023 um, I remember 23 and 24. 23 and 24. Thank, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, I remember I went to uh, Seattle to Puget Sound Regional Council and sold my soul for a million dollars uh, for Tremont and for our cost overruns. And uh, the commitment I made was that we would not uh, participate in this funding cycle. So I hope you, uh, so we're not planning on preparing any applications. Um, and uh, it was unprecedented that. Uh, people get additional money. It was a big deal that we got that money and I think it was well worth it because uh, we're still uh, recovering from Tremont. I think Mark's got PTSD. <laughs> so, uh, Kitsap Transit, uh, we have two boat service out of Bremerton starting February 24th. So I uh, saw a draft schedule of that and I've seen the uh, pictures of the new Southworth boat and it's looking like a boat and they're painting it and uh, it is scheduled to start service this fall. So uh, out of Southworth to Seattle on 23 minute crossing. So uh, we need both of those boats though. So unlike we're not going to start that service until we have a spare boat. Um, it was a lesson learned from the Bremerton service. Uh, to the mayor's report, uh, I've got a few things. Um, Village Green's visit is scheduled for February 24th, 11 a.m. Kathleen Wilson, myself, Cindy, and Jay, I think, have signed up. If others want to go, uh, you're welcome to come. We're going to just go tour Village Green's. And a uh, reminder again, your F1 reports are due April 15th, and they've changed that format, so it's a little more uh, cumbersome to f complete those reports, so don't wait till the last minute. Uh, I copied a little uh, picture out of the Puget Sound Business Journal. And if you go to the left, the gray bubbles there, and that's job this last year. This is out of the business, Puget Sound Business Journal. Job creation, crop, job creation versus housing units built last year. And you can see that Kitsap County was virtually one to one at 0 0.99 to one jobs for housing units created. Pierce County was almost two to one two jobs being created for every housing unit. Snohomish County was similar, and King County was three jobs. For every three jobs being created, only they can't keep up with housing. Only one house is, or housing unit is being created for every three jobs. So that's part of the, the housing uh, pressure that we're feeling uh, because they can't keep up over there. So I just wanted to share that data. Um, Met uh, Monday with the state auditors at the Housing Kitsap Finance uh, Board, and uh, there we're going to once again the agency is uh, it's still troubled. Um, I think we're in better shape, but remember the, the auditors are always looking at uh, a more a year ago, and uh, so they they still their audit findings related to the software <coughs> conversion. We know that 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 was a disaster and. Um, we still don't have financial statements because we have draft for financial statements finally, but uh, in the not during that audit period, we still do not have uh, audited financial statements and they have still have concerns about the financial uh, stability and viability of the agency and uh, as we all do. And, uh, yes, I have a quick question and I don't know if this is the forum to address it, but there's a recent article that Housing Kitsap was expending resources at properties in Mason County. No, so there's a 
program. It's a self-help program. Okay. And um, it's, I wanna see, it's not a HUD program. I'm not particularly, it's a federal program. And we're having trouble, and it's based on demographics. And it is a program that it's what's happening up here on uh, the Sherman Ridge. Yeah. That's a self-help project. And it is becoming increasingly difficult for, for Cows and Kitsap to find uh, property to develop that meets the, the criteria of this program. And that's so affordable. that's affordable. That's the affordability factor in this. And uh, so we re the agency recently bought, with, with it, and it's not the housing authority's general dollars. It is uh, a specific program dollars that come from this program and it has to to meet certain criteria for affordability and virtually we, we north kitsap doesn't even work anymore mm -hmm. bainbridge island mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we're just we're having to uh, i guess cast the net farther to to find property that uh, that meets the criteria for the self-help program and the self-help program is where they build houses you know in groups and you and your neighbors Build with the help of a uh, sweat equity. The sweat, sweat equity, yeah. <clears throat> Helping with the with the assistance of a, a site manager build your own home. Um, so it's a it's a path to home ownership, but these houses have to be, uh, you know, have meet affordability standards, and it's tough to do that with the rising costs of land. So good question. Uh, <coughs> but any, anyway, so I, unfortunately, you're likely to read when the auditors auditors. Uh, issue the report you're likely likely to read about housing kits up again uh, in the kit in the newspaper and uh, it's nothing that i'm not aware of and i'm just continuing to communicate that um a couple weeks ago i was at awc i'm on the adb association of washington cities board and uh, there was the action days in, in olympia and uh <coughs> we I was, while I was down there, I testified on a, a number of bills. I met with uh, Representative Caldier. I met with Senator King, Councilmember Ashby. Met with, last week, I think it was, uh, which senator? I, I didn't meet with the senator. I testified before the Senate Transportation right. Committee. Um, and it was very informative. I could I could give a, I'll give a little report on it in that we were testifying because Senator Hobbs is um, has presented a forward Washington group of um, projects transportation projects to fund it's similar to what he had last year and then he has a revenue side to it too and he he led the meeting saying that he did not think there would be traction on it this year but they were still doing preliminary work. What was interesting is Captain Schrader um, was down there also. And I don't know if you guys know Captain Schrader. He had been, um, don't know what his role is right now with PSNS, but he. I think he might even be as part of the Admiral staff. Yeah, he, anyway, he, I don't want to say he was in charge of Naval Base Kitsap, but no. But and he's not in that role now, but the Admiral had sent him down to meet with this committee also. And when we testified, um, Captain Schrader did not ask to testify. He said he was available for, for questions. But Senator Hobbs brought him up to the podium uh, with myself and representative from Gig Harbor. And Senator Hobbs was very interested in asking and, and engaged with Captain Schrader a lot. And so he's, they're very, very interested on doing something for Gorst and, and that entire package. And so I found that very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Encouraging, <coughs> encouraging for us. And so then at our KRCC meeting, Captain Reinhardt had asked KRCC, the transportation, or the people involved with the transportation, Transpol committee to look at putting a coalition together. And so we're doing that because we do believe that there's an opportunity for moving something forward um, for the congestion and the resiliency needs down in the Gorst area. So I was, I was very, very encouraged um, by what I heard down there that day. And uh, so we're advocating one for, as part of the Gorst 
course solutions, whatever those may turn out to be. And secondly, the last, this package and the prior package last year, our Sedgwick project the, for the interchanges at Sedgwick and Highway 16 are on there. And we've got, you know, if they fall off there, it'll be virtually impossible to get them back on. Right. So it's important for, even if the package doesn't move forward, that we're there advocating and make sure that, that our projects stay in these state, statewide po uh, yeah. packages. Um, back to the AWC conference, I also was elected the, uh, the chair of AWC's uh, audit committee. I, I sat, uh, listened to several interesting panels uh, with Hobbs and, and uh, King, Senator, both of those senators talked about various issues. Um, and it was interesting when you're talking, when you, you talking to other elected officials, you know, how similar our challenges are, whether it's parking in our downtown, uh, growth pressures, you know, keeping up with infrastructure. And uh, when I talk to other, other mayors and, and uh, council members from other cities, how similar our challenges are, but actually, you know, I stress out a bit and I know staff's working very hard, but um, we're actually in a, in a lot better shape than, than many places. So uh, I guess makes us makes me feel a little better. Um, Tony Lang gave us, got, got me some, so our electrician is very busy with a number of um, startup of lift station one and a generator install. So I asked them to, the marquee, <coughs> the north uh, east quadrant still isn't functioning, the, the lights. And we got a quote on that of $20,000 uh, to fix the electrical uh, on that. Um, I've talked to the merchant, Kathleen, and uh, <coughs> And I've also talked to uh, Corrine Haydock about us getting to that when we can, because we can do, the, the materials are about $4,000, the rest of it is labor. Now we still have labor costs, but we're gonna be able to do that for about half that and sometime, you know, April is, and we would do it, you know, picking away at it as we can. In the meantime though, the lights won't work underneath that section of the marquee. So I just wanted to, if anybody asks you about that, that's, how we plan to move forward and save about ten thousand dollars. So, um, I read Friday about the county uh, shuttering part of Veterans Park and uh, kind of got my attention. And there was a quote by the parks director that he'd been talking to the city, and that hadn't really gotten any traction. So I called Commissioner Greedo. I haven't got a call back, but I, I don't know. Nobody's talked to me about Veterans Park, and uh, I think we would be. Uh, missing out if we didn't include that in part of our park study. And so uh, uh, we, Mark and I, I think Mark and I both said that we should include that in the study and uh, you know, it's a big park and it has a lot of uh, deferred maintenance, but if we're gonna, if, if, if our citizens um, are willing to support a parks and recs levy and have more parks in our community, I think that's an asset we definitely should uh, try to get. I know during the economic downturn, the county w was wanting to get rid of some things, in particular Given Center, but they didn't want to give it away. They wanted to sell it to us. For, 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 for No, in, in millions. <coughs> and uh, I, I, we weren't interested, but I haven't had any discussions about Veterans Park, and I hope to have some. Um, our community service day has been scheduled um, for March 21st. And uh, a lot of beauty bark and things of that nature going on around downtown, McCormick Village Park and playground chips and other <coughs> places. Um, we really wanted to wait for the transportation committee to start, but their mis me first meeting isn't until February 25th. And um, Chris Hamner, Hammer, our new assistant city engineer, is very versed on grants and transportation programs, and we have a deadline for a transportation grant that we want, we're gonna apply for um, before that deadline. And in looking at, the, if, and we're gonna apply for design dollars, and in this particular program, we can take design <coughs> dollars without starting a clock. It is the Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program. We were looking at uh, Salmonberry for being phase one. This particular program is geared towards uh, uh, ac 
accidents and serious accidents. And actually the intersection that on Bethel that would score the best on this is the Lincoln uh, roundabout at the other end, which was a future phase. But if we can get somebody else's money, um, it, the other one, Chris doesn't believe will score well because it doesn't have the serious accidents that Lincoln has about three times as much. <coughs> so so is, is this part of the grant information we got maybe two months ago where there was three kinds of grant opportunities, pedestrian improvements, safety improvements, and I can't remember the third bucket. And we talked about a t t today a TIB's program and a, a um, um, complete streets. There's a, there's a bucket uh -huh. of dollars at, at the state. To be honest, I'm not sure, but Chris just made me aware of this today. Okay. And, and, and it's got a pretty short deadline, like in about a week. And uh, right. this is the, so I think that previous conversation was looking at two different programs. One is TIB Complete Street, TIB Urban Arterial Program, but this is the road safety plan that we were going to hire a consultant for, but Chris had prepared one from Bainbridge and he came down and we saved $20,000 by doing it ourselves. And so we have now to add to our transportation package, which includes our pavement management system, ADA. Uh, transition plan now we have this um, road safety plan that gives us a whole different uh, opening into funding on top of which we've already been doing through TIB for urban arterial and complete streets so, um, so I think I if we you know if guarantee we, we're gonna get this money right. but we wanted you know I'm relying on Chris's expertise to, to put forward the project that would score the best so yeah, we're what submitting is the both. Or is it just design? Yeah, or this is just this is just design. It'd be a design a design for that uh, that roundabout. It could be design and right away, but it's it doesn't. There's no federal clock. We don't worry. You don't have to worry about the ten year clock ticking. Yeah. So yeah, anyways, we're, yeah. we're gonna cast the line and and. Uh, and if it doesn't work, then we'll continue with our plan to use our dollars to design salmonberry and blueberry and, and that, that segment there, which is what we identified as our, to what we wanted to go forward with first. But we don't believe, Chris didn't believe, based on the accident data, which is a major criteria for this grant, that it would, it would score well. So yeah, we're there's, a, there's another issue, too, because phase one, remember, is salmonberry and blueberry with roundabouts. So you have ability to do the median and Ramsey Road all at the same time, that's a much larger project. We know that's our phase one, but if we got funding to do the Lincoln Lundberg Mitchell Y correction, and we get the money to fix that, we know that nothing really north or south of that we're doing anything with. We're doing a roundabout at ultimately at uh, Lund and Bethel in the future, but this could be a standalone roundabout because everything north of that we're not changing where it's going to be more problematic to do just a single roundabout at salmonberry as a standalone because that really needs to have its companion so there's some benefits if we got the money i would absolutely recommend us taking that money yeah so no guarantees we're going to get the money i'm just making you aware that we're going to throw a, throw a, yeah, so attempt to get a grant. I, I, the, the question, my question was it's design it's not right away acquisition or anything like that for design and right away. Okay. Especially Depends knowing on how much we get. Yeah. Especially knowing that one of the parcels is in that county pot that we're well, that, that's my looking that's at my purchasing. next my next item is and you'll see this at your transportation committee is that uh, that the county is planning to surplus their uh, what properties that they have on Bethel and but by their appraisals is about 1.8 million dollars but it's about 600,000 of it that are parcels that are outside the city. Uh, in our urban growth area, well, they're not in our city. I don't think we should be pursuing those. But the uh, the remainder, it's about a million one or a million two, that is our par our parcels along the Bethel corridor, and it would be the right of way for this particular uh, traffic improvement. So uh, we'll talk about that more. I'm just making you aware that the county is. Is that something we'll pick up at transportation as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you'll see that at the transportation committee. So that ends my report. So we have uh, directors. Mr. Dorsey, you have anything additional to share this evening? Yeah, some very quick updates. So I think the February 19th Utility Committee, I think 
we're not going to have any really new information, so those committee members aren't here, so I'll send out a cancellation okay. for that. Um, the second thing is well 11, which is bringing that drilled 1,500 foot deep well at McCormick and the McCormick well filled online. That RFQ is actually out on the street, as is the city hall upgrade repairs. That's also out on the street. And the final thing is I did spend on last Thursday on the 6th on behalf of the Public Works Board representing small cities um, for infrastructure. I spent the, the day on the Hill, met with 13 legislators, House and Senate, um, and it was fascinating. Our main message was to stop the diversions from the Public Works Assistant account um, and continue to let the fund revenue sources that we have that go into that fund not be diverted into other funds. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars every budget that gets diverted, and the total diversions are in the billions. So that's money that's specifically taxes on utilities that are supposed to go to infrastructure improvements that are being diverted into other programs. So it was very interesting working the day, working with legislatures, coming on and off the floor, and grabbing them for 15 minutes and trying to convince them. So it was very educational. Charlotte. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to, just briefly, uh, last Friday, as you all know, is the date for legislation to get out of committee, and a couple of OPMA PRA bills have made it out, um, and some are uh, going to have some substantial impact on cities, so I will keep you posted as we learn more about what's going to come out of the legislature on those, on those topics in particular. Thanks. Uh, Mayor, Council, nothing specific, but uh, we're doing some really good work downstairs, and uh, I got some good feedback from one of the, the members of the uh, the audience. You, you should be very, very proud of your police department. So please interact with them as much as you can. They like hearing from you guys. Thank you. And you're going to be back in a couple of weeks, and we're going to have some awards. Yes. So February 25th, we'll have uh, an officer of the year. Um, we had a sergeant get an award from the local paper, and then we have two life-saving medals to give out. Anything from the clerk's office, Janine? Nothing to report. Okay. Tony, you're sitting in the cheap seats back there. You got nothing from you? Okay. All right. That ends our, our uh, department directors. We're to our second citizen comment period. I appreciate your patience this evening. Thank you for being here tonight. I hope it was educational for you. And uh, you're welcome at this time to address the council on any matter. Please state your name for the record. And uh, there's a red light, yellow light, and red light, and that's three minutes. So you're, you're entitled to three minutes. And I guess to remind, remind the audience that the city council, yeah. only the hearing examiner actually will be taking testimony yeah. and so, responding. So the council won't be hearing the welcome, project. We're welcome to comment, but the word. It's not going to go anywhere. It doesn't go, go, yeah, that's right. Not from here. That's not true. Yeah, but we still we want to hear from you. It's good practice, right? It I've is. I've never been to one of these before. It's very interesting. So, my name's Jill. I live in McCormick Woods, and it bumps up against the parcel A. Jill, um, can you state your last name for the record? Oh, Donovan. Sorry, Donovan. Um, so I got the letter. I was kind of concerned. I wrote my letter to the city, and I also requested um, their environmental report and they sent it back with to me. In my line of work, I love to research. So I read through this report and I looked, I noticed that they spent one day there and their findings came back as no wetlands, no fish, no wildlife. So I thought, no wildlife, how can that be? I see deer, owls, everything, every day. So I called them, spoke to Matt, and he, he confirmed, yeah, we spent one day there. Couldn't tell me how many hours. And, and I asked, what, what is your definition of wildlife? He couldn't really tell me what his definition was. And he said he could, he could not talk further about this report. So then I went to the US Fish and Wildlife. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, did they do an IPAC report? And I said, well, I don't see one in the this report log. 
He said, but he said, I could do it. Anybody can do it. So I said, he explained to me how to do it. So I went to the IPAC website through the wildlife, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, highlighted the area I wanted to, the parcel A, clicked results, and it came back with four endangered species. So that's just my, my findings, and I guess I'll have to take, so I, I then went to the Audubon Society, because there's three, three birds on there that are endangered, uh, or one bird that is endangered and one that is threatened. So I, I guess I'm arguing about when they say no wild, wildlife and they can't give me a definition of what wildlife is. So. Could we get a copy of that? I mean, I'd like a copy of that. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can give you copies of it. Do you want the report or just the? Just the IPAC search that you did. Yeah, sure. And I spoke to Neil, a lovely guy at the U.S. Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife. He was very helpful. So, yeah, I'll be more than happy to give All right. you a copy. Thank you for your comment. Others wishing to address the council? Okay. Our meeting is not quite adjourned. We're going to go into an executive session, I would say, for 15 <coughs> minutes to talk about a real estate matter with no action to be taken afterwards. It's pursuant to RCW 4230.1101I. And as I said, there will be no action taken <coughs> afterwards. We'll adjourn the meeting after we return. <coughs>